I've bitten off quite a lot reproducing this, especially as this is not my given period. Hi, it's Todd from Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here and today I'm with Stuart Orme, the curator of the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon and I have got one of Oliver Cromwell's original swords in front of me which I'm here to document because I'm going to be making a copy of it and bringing it back in with Stuart's blessing to yep. compare the two. Absolutely. And it's going to be a difficult job. So tell me about the sword, Stuart. I hate to say it, Topper, you've not picked the easiest one to choose here. As you can see, it's hugely elaborate. Yeah. So um, this beautiful item is one of three swords we've got in the collection, which are on long-term loan to uh, the Cromwell Museum uh, from Cromwell's descendants. So they've got a pretty unimpeachable provenance to them. Um, so there's always the chance of, of fakery and hoodwinkery in the past. Yep. But essentially, this is a dead sir once Oliver Cromwell sword. Um, of the other swords we've got, one of them actually appears in one of the paintings, so that's absolutely cast <laughs> that's iron. Winner, you can't yeah. really argue with that. Uh, this one we know certainly was in the family as far back as the 1700s. Um, it's been passed down ever since with all the details and everything else out of it. We're kind of 99% certain. So it's as close as you can get yeah. with this sort of thing. May I? Of course you may. <laughs> this is the privilege, the real privilege of what I do. You just see the YouTube stuff. I get to handle it. And days like this. Yeah. Thank you, Stuart. It's light, isn't it? It is. I mean, it's again, it's one of the mythologies which you must deal with all the time about, you know, uh, particularly things like Hollywood movies tend to depict swords as great sort of chunks of iron, mm. which are really unwieldy. This is beautifully balanced. And uh, I have to say, I've always sort of said this is actually my favourite sword in the collection. Uh, I've always had a running joke with myself that if the zombie apocalypse ever happens, this is my weapon of choice. It's not, you know, you know, though, I'd want something a bit more cleavery. <laughs> Possibly I'm, to get through those zombie skulls, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Zombie apocalypse, falchion. Yeah. <laughs> but I get where you're coming from, it is beautiful. It's lovely and it's really well balanced. Goodness, what a thing. And it is in exceptionally good condition. And there is, it's always interesting with, with anything which has got complex hilt is you pick up a reproduction and, or, or sort of a reenactment reproduction, which yeah. as a reenactor actually you're familiar with as well. Yeah. And, and the hilts are usually massive and really gappy and you pick up a real one and they're really very close to the fist. Mm. And actually um, here, the, the guard is actually touching my fist. There has been some uh, deformation where it's been dropped or stamped on or something. Possibly. But not a lot. No. And it has already touched my fist. So you can see here where there's a bit of deformation. I'm guessing that it was probably no more than six or seven millimetres, a quarter of an inch, between my fist and that guard when it was originally done. But look at this. What an extraordinary piece. So, I've bitten off quite a lot reproducing this, especially as this is not my given period. But what a thing. So the blade we think is German. Um, you correctly identified that with some of the markings on the blade here. Um, it's also been inscribed with his initials. You can see in the, the very yeah. short fuller there is on the blade here as well. But interestingly, we've got, so we've got the running wolf of Passau mm. on both sides yeah. and the initials on both sides and the maker's stamp on both sides, maker's mark, which is... I can't recall seeing that actually before. It's quite unusual. Um, I, I'm not aware of many other e existing examples of it, but um, yes, it's uh, obviously somebody was making a, quite a statement with this particular sword. We'll weigh this in due course, um, but I mean, oh, it's, it's under two pounds. It's, mm. I don't know, a kilo-ish, maybe, no, a little bit more, a little bit more. So I, I, I think I, from, me bit. from memory, it's been a while since I've measured it, but it's, mm. uh, it's about a kilo in weight. It balances right about on the initial O. Oh. <laughs> it balances an Oliver. Absolutely. But what a thing. Basket hilt here, this is of course typical of the, the type of sword that we refer mm. to as a mortuary sword. And it's got kind of some of the classic decoration that you can see on a mortuary sword, which are these sort of little heads yeah. um, of people on here. Now, the reason why we call it a mortuary sword is, a, 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 yet again, a Victorianism. It's interesting though that it is very delicately made, in mm. the sense of I'm looking at these guards here, 1.5, 1.8 millimetres thick, 
five millimeters wide, yep. any kind of a sword strike on that is going to collapse it onto your hand. So that whole concept of a sword being indestructible is yet again shown to be just junk. I mean, I, I think this one here is very much an officer's sword, and it's uh, it's one that's sort of as much a status symbol as anything mm. else out of it, as well as being obviously a functioning weapon. What is quite interesting, though, and is quite unusual compared to many of Ortery's swords of this period, is this thumb ring on this side, um, which we don't tend to see quite so many examples mm. of. And actually, I find personally that it's sort of, you know, when I've held it, it actually feels it almost balances the sword a little bit better once you've kind of got your thumb inside it. Well, you Yes, I mean, it makes the whole thing more nimble, you know, you're, yeah. you're, I'm not a fencer in that sense, but I certainly used to, and I understand that the, the additional control that gives you. That has not been cast, uh, that has been formed and chiselled. Presumably, yes. Uh, and you, that's your form. area of expertise far more than mine. <laughs> oh. That is one evil job, I can tell you. <laughs> He said, peering over his glasses, because he <laughs> barely see the detail. So, what a fascinating thing. What I would say is, as a piece of quality work, it is not phenomenal. No. There is, there is better quality pieces. It um, is, but I, I think that, you know, that possibly uh, meets the needs of the period we're talking mm. about, where you're manufacturing stuff in a sort of a period of a civil war, um, where perhaps there isn't necessarily the sort of the time and uh, craftsmanship available to be able to work on these sorts of things um, to the level of detail you might do in peacetime, for example. Mm. I've noticed it before very often in, in museum swords that you look at it and you look at it from a metre away mm. and you're blown away by how extraordinary the piece is. Yeah. And then you pick it up and you squint at it like I'm doing, peering over my Absolutely. specs. Absolutely. And you go, oh, actually. And there's yeah. one I'm thinking of particularly in, in the Wallace collection that I love. Mm. And do you look at it, it's just stunning. Stunning, stunning piece. And then you pick it up and you study it and you think, actually, that work is rough as heck. It really is. But the thing is, it looks good, great there. You know, he's on a horse, he's moving around, he's commanding his troops, he's waving his sword in the air. Yeah. And it looks fantastic. To some extent, I mean, a lot of this stuff is for show um, mm. from a distance because obviously, you know, nobody's going to come that close mm. to him, as it were, to be able to examine these yeah. sorts of things. I it. always bang on about that with, with, with weapons. You have the show side and you yeah. have the not show side. Yeah. And the not show side can be rough as heck sometimes. Yeah. And yeah. because it's just not important, this is going to take some doing. <laughs> <laughs> How am I going to reproduce this? Because it really is a piece of work. I'm going to measure it now, just taking all the principal measurements, tracing it, and that's going to give me all the information for the blade work. That's fine, that's relatively straightforward. It's actually, thankfully, a relatively straightforward blade. The hilt work, that's a killer. I have a sculptor friend who can do this, mm. but actually he works on films quite a lot, and he is away and out of the country. So the proposition that I am going for now is that I am going to photograph all of this, put it using a process called photogrammetry, which will make a 3D uh, visual model of this hilt. And then what I'll do is 3D print that, and then I'm going to send that to my friend Matt, and Matt is going to sculpt the detail onto that form. So in that way, we get the form absolutely perfect, yeah. and we get the humanity of the sculpting that Matt's going to give it, because he is a genius when it comes it's, to this. It's a nice compromise between sort of old and new in a way, really, isn't it, then, and getting the best of both worlds in terms I, of producing a replica. I think very much so, because... The steel chiseler who did this, that's his job. That's all he's done for the last 20, yeah. 30, 40 years. That's not all that I've done. And I'm just not going to be good enough. So first thing is we will trace this. Uh, I'll put a few notations on it and uh, we'll take it from there. Cool. OK. We're going to trace the blade on here and then I'll turn it around and we'll carry on with all the, the major measurements. He's a pointy little fellow, this one, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Now, really, what I'm going to do is make reference measurements so that when I have my model, right. I can refer to this. So I'm just going to mark off. These are all the little details you need to look for. So it's sort of rounded on the underneath and then flat mm. on that. So it has a, an equator to it. It's a hexagonal grip, mm. but it transitions from round at the pommel going into uh, a fairly pronounced hexagon and then coming down into an oval. So it's a blend the whole way through and then covered in the most evil wire work I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> 
when you measure it down to that level, the level of fluctuation really does show, as you say, it's a sort of handmade item, isn't mm. it? So, you know, that the, you've got that level of difference inside it that you wouldn't get from a precision machine made item necessarily no. today. It's a full data set for the blade here, all the cross sections. And then really just notations about the hilt, because obviously there's an awful lot of complexity in the hilt and in the wire work and so on. Well, the first part has been done, so I've noted all the dimensions, all my little sketches, all my little thoughts and insights into it on a piece of paper. Right. Very old school. Yep. And now I'm going modern, and it's a process called photogrammetry. So what happens is I just take well, hundreds of photos, very steadily just moving around in an arc, changing the sword uh, position, taking more photos, and then goes into a piece of software, stitches them all together and creates basically a 3D view of this hilt work here. So here we are. Excellent. So, I think it sounds simple. <laughs> somebody else's problem. <laughs> right. It's interesting, actually, I mean, as we were saying, so even, uh, you know, as somebody who's very used to this object, it's sort of, it's interesting looking at it for this level of time and particularly in this lighting as well. You kind of notice, you know, even more detail on it than I'm usually used to. Yes. Yeah. You spend your day doing your job, not uh, looking at pieces all the time. No, and absolutely. In a small museum like this where, you know, you're kind of, my job involves being everything from sort of fundraiser to doing the cleaning to volunteer manager to dealing with retail bits and pieces and all sorts of stuff. Um, yes, you know, it's actually nice to be able to spend this level of time actually with a, mm. with a single object. I've taken every photo I need to take <laughs> and probably doubled that. It'll be really interesting actually to see the... Uh, the melding of very modern technology with very old school technology like I run. Um, but really, thank you so much, because I know You're as a welcome. charitable organisation, you know, this is kind of a big deal for you as well. Yeah, it's, it's the best collection in the world of artefacts relating yeah. to Cromwell, so the largest on public display. And uh, yeah, our job is to tell the story of this uh, hugely significant, um, uh, fascinating, remarkable, yeah, but also very controversial figure yeah. and bring them to life for people. So, well, and I think you do it very well. Thank you. Absolute privilege handling this sword. So thank you for letting me, thank you for letting me measure it, photograph it and ultimately reproduce it. So. No, no, we're very much looking forward to seeing the finished article. About a year, maybe, maybe, maybe. Well, uh, you know, do bring it back and we'll compare it to the original mm. and uh, see, what, see what sort of the differences between the two of them are and hope, yeah. you know, how close it gets. No, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do that. It's always an absolute pleasure to lay things side by side and have a look. So, Brilliant. Stuart, Cromwell Museum, thank you very much. You're very welcome, Todd. Thank you very much. Thank you.